so we are recording tonight. So since I finally hit the right button, we will get going. All right, so y'all's messages are popping up in there, so I'm having to turn that down so it didn't blow me out over here. All right, so trauma overview, like I said in the beginning, we will, if Chris Wally can hit the right button. All right, so as we all know, as our national competencies, we have our trauma applies the knowledge, the fundamental knowledge that provides basic and selected advanced emergency care and transportation based on assessments that we find when we deal with our acutely injured patients. All right, so we're going to be talking about our pathophysiology. We'll go over the assessment and management of our particular trauma patients. We'll talk about some trauma scoring. We'll go over some rapid transport and destination issues, and then what particular transport modes that we decide to do and why. We'll also talk about our multi-system trauma, recognizing the management of those multi-systems, the pathophysiology assessment and management of the multi-system and some blast injuries. All right, I personally, not a fan of CDC, but they do keep a lot of good records and some good information that we talk about. According to the CDC, unintentional injury is primarily the cause of death and disability in people between the age of one and 44. That's pretty, that's a lot. That's pretty bad. If we have to think about that, I would, there's a few things that I'm terrified of dying of, but one is drowning. That's my biggest one. Our proper pre-hospital evaluation is the most important thing that we can do to our patients to help minimize our suffering, some long-term disabilities, and potential some death, death and trauma. If we recognize that early, we activate our trauma system like I'm um, going to speak specifically for here in Mississippi, we can reach out and notify Mississippi MedCom that is hosted by our University of Mississippi Medical Center right here in Jackson. And they also have the ability to notify other receiving hospitals. They have uh, ways to act, help us activate our helicopters. They can do all sorts of things from the background so they can monitor all different channels. So if you're from Mississippi, doesn't matter if it's from a uh, North state line to the South state line, East and West. If you just happen to call them on a way to a call that comes out as it sounds pretty bad, they can monitor your radio frequency in the background. And depending upon how it sounds, they may key up and talk to you on their particular, on your channel and, or go ahead and get the helicopter already semi ready to go, uh, which is a really good thing uh, in the trauma industry. So we want to talk about understanding the basic physical concept concepts that dictate how injuries occur and affect the human body. This will allow us to do a good scene size up, what we see, how we see, we understand what potentially can go on. So we're building that scene size up. We're starting to build it in our minds. So we want to evaluate our MOIs for the trauma will provide in the index of the suspicion of for different types and serious and or life-threatening underlying conditions. Now, we do have an index of suspicion that we start to believe is for some potential serious injuries or underlining or unseen injuries in our patients just because of what does the scene look like? Is this a really bad two-car accident or did the car appear to have rolled multiple times? And certainly, Certain injury patterns can occur due to the types of energy events that we come across and see. Uh, if we're pondering, we look, you have a multi rollover. If you see that they've rolled over multiple times, that's an idea that we're going to have a pretty good serious injury. And we've all had those instances where we don't have, we have those walking people that come out of these massive wrecks that's just nothing happened to them, which is a great, but there's still a the underlining potential chance for high severity of injuries. And then the amount of energy exchange has a major role in severity of injuries, al along with anatomic structures potentially involved. So anytime that we talk about a rollover, a uh, side impact or anything like that, you have all those coup contra coup effects. You have the motions, things stay in motion, the, all the laws that have those uh, potential injury events that we have on our patients. Those are all there. We go through them, but we may not turn around and have that potential injury of our patient when we're working with them due to maybe they were one in a million lucky patients. All right, so injury and trauma. Traumatic injuries occur when the body's tissues are exposed to energy levels beyond their tolerance. So the kind of way we look at it is there's a chart, and I don't remember the, the chart, but it is like 
it takes so many pounds per square inch to pull off the human ear or to rip off the nose. But so that is past our tolerance of being able to function with that. It's the same thing with our organs. Our organs not necessarily free flow, but they do free float around on the insides. So when we talk about trauma and our insides and all, they have those potential effects to exceed their natural compat their tolerance and cause a lot of issues. Sorry, all these messages coming through and they're all coming through my watch, my phone, the screen. So three concepts of energy are typically associated with injuries. We have our p potential energy, our kinetic energy, energy, and the energy of work. So obviously looking at your screen, I'm trying to see if that is a heart or another organ, but I'm going to go with the heart. So there was this one here on I-20 here and right outside of Rankin County. We worked a really bad accident. Two 18-wheelers were rear-ended each other. We park, we get out, we walk up, we're trying to assess the scene. There's a big fire going on. We just see this chunk of something laying on the ground, unaware what it was. We had no idea. We knew that the driver in the front had gotten out, and the rear driver was a tag team driver. One was driving, one was asleep in a sleeper. The driver of the second 18-wheeler did get out. The other one was not able to get out. He ended up, unfortunately, burning to death. So we knew he was accounted for. So we knew at the beginning we had three potential patients. As we were working the call and everything went on and on, we started to understand by bypassers that there was a, we're missing a car. There was a little red car that was between them. What so happened is that chunk of something that we didn't know was actually the patient in the middle vehicle it was actually his heart. He got hit so hard that it actually expelled his heart from his body. So that completely went past the, the level of tolerance that his body was able to control. We were never able to recover him. He actually, everything burnt up that it was just so hot and everything was on fire. So we talk about those tolerances. We have to realize, depending upon speed, what they impact and anything like that has issues to cause some serious injuries. So we have different forms of energy that produce different kinds of trauma. Our mechanical en energy is energy from motion. We talk about kinetic energy reflects the relationship between the mass of the object and the velocity at which it is traveling. So there's the, the, the chart uh, or the actual the, the equation on how to figure out what the kinetic energy is. <laughs> I've never had to do one of those in my life. I, I don't, it, it's, there was no reason for me to ever have to do that. And then you have your potential energy is energy stored in an object such as a brick sitting on the building's ledge. So we know that it does have potential energy, but it's not been activated. It's not going anywhere. Let's say that brick weighs two pounds and it pushed off the side of the building. It's kinetic energy is going to stay the same, even though it's potential energy. It's going to stay the same no matter what height it is. It's just going to obviously be a lot higher and a lot harder. So we have to figure those out. If something that we need to, we can use that kinetic energy, that the math equation. But again, I've been doing this 25 years. I'm not real sure if I've ever, like I said, needed that. I don't know about Patricia and Rob. Definitely don't want to speak for them. But I, I'm sure that we would have shared that information at one time of why we've had to figure that out. So you have your chemical energy is energy released by as a result of a chemical reaction. It can be found in an explosive. So we talk about explosives. We know we have our initial, our secondary, and our tertiary, all those potential injuries that do come in contact. But during an explosion, we talk about the thermal energy. We know that the thermal energy is then transferred from the source that are hotter than the body. So if they act, say they put in ball bearings or washers or screws, anything like that, those are expelled. They do have the heat that is pushing them, and they can create some heat when they uh, hit whatever object that they're there. But that's the things that we saw there in like the Boston bombing, a lot of your Middle Eastern bombings, and things like that were part of those. I actually saw today as I was coming home that they actually at the border today, they caught a, a gentleman from the Middle East. He was part of one of the radical groups in the Middle East that he had been trained on how to create bombs and all that. And they they caught him. He was on his way to New York. Uh, so we know that is one of the issues that we have to worry about. But 
we still need to know what potential injuries are going to be coming when we talk about explosions and chemicals, because we talk about a chemical too, is when it, it, that initial blast will take the air out. If you, you get hit and move, you can lose your, your breath for just a little bit. It was one of those that everybody's had the wind knocked out of them at least once. So that's rough. So your mechanism of injury profiles, we talk about some different types of MOIs that will produce many different types of injuries. So injuries sustained by trauma patients may be a result of a multi-system trauma. It falls from height, motor vehicle accidents, motorcycle crashes, gunshots, and then stabbings. Knowing how stabbing, like the history of, a lot of times women come up, up, down, and up. They come like this motion. Men come down this way. It is a height deal. Now, that is not saying that is going to be every time we go to a call. That's way that we get a stabbing is going to take place. But we can, I can understand which one is stabbed if you come from up, down, and up, or up to down. Those give you some ideas. Gunshot wounds. A long time ago, when I was working the streets of Jackson, I used to transport a lot of gunshot wounds. And I always asked, what could we do to improve our care for a patient outside the hospital. I was talking to one of the head trauma doctors one time, and he said the reason why we don't have more deaths in the area is just due to the fact that they're using cheap ammo. So you think about that no matter if you have a 22 can kill somebody, yes. A BB gun, yes. But the size of the hole, the size of the shock wave and all that is going to be dependent upon what caliber of ammo that they're using also what size bullet um, if you're using like a full metal jacket versus a hollow point you're going to have different injuries uh, internal injuries due from those potential shock waves we want to also maintain a very high suspicion of serious unseen injuries anytime we go to uh, some of those types of trauma calls um, that's one of those you, you learn as you go. And I know a lot of folks have been out there or y'all been first responders before, so you get some good idea on things going on. But the more calls that you run, that you're on the ambulance more, you're going to see more of these. And it is one of those that you learn more and more. So having those ideas of mechanism of injuries from different size uh, bullets to injury, penetration, uh, penetrating objects. Sorry, my brain got fried there for a second. That's like I actually have a somewhere on my phone. I have a picture of a gentleman that I took care of, got shot three times in the head. He was alive. All we have is entrance wounds. And they took the x-ray and we're actually able to see those three wounds. He did get shot by 22. It still required a lot of surgery, but it was like, how is this guy living? It was just the distance and all the things that it actually went through in the vehicle to get to him. They weren't super, super deep. They did make some impact in certain areas of the skull. Excuse me. We will see these patients that were like, how did they survive? And that's one thing I've learned after being 20, 25 years into this. I don't ask why anymore or how. I just take it for the way it is. It's one of those, if you ask, how did this happen? Sometimes you just don't want to know or you're just like, mm, I, I'm not, I, I don't know about that. So now I've quit doing that and I just take it for face value and roll with it. All right, so blunt and penetrating trauma. So a blunt trauma is the result of a force that the body that causes the body injury primarily without any penetrating the soft tissues or internal organs or cavities. But if I hit you with a baseball bat, a pipe, a wrench that is blunt, we know that hits you. You can have soft tissue injuries, organ injuries. Now, penetrating obviously has its name. It's, we, it's going to penetrate into the body. Penetrating trauma results in injury by objects that pierce and penetrate the surface of the body and injure the underlying soft tissues, internal organs, and body cavities. Either type of trauma may occur from a variety of MOIs. So you can have those penetrating or blunts on just a regular MVC. You get a side impact. It depends on how much intrusion is inside that vehicle. You can have a blunt injury from that. Same thing for penetrating. Depends on what you carry in your vehicle. If you could have a limb stuck through you or a pencil or pen or anything like that could be become penetrating objects. 
a blunt injury, so the result from an object that makes contact with the body. And I always remember this one as a baseball bat. If I if kids are playing baseball and they're warming up and they're swinging around and they swing and they let go, that bat is going to hit somebody or potentially can hit them and create that blunt trauma force. Now, we can also have blunt tra uh, blunt injuries from your motor vehicle crashes. Those can take place also. So maintain a high index of suspicion during patient assessment during patient assessment for those potential hidden injuries. Let's talk about motor vehicle accidents. So classified traditionally as a frontal head-on rear end or a T-bone, rollovers or rotational spins. These are some pictures that we have seen in the past that we know which ones are which. For our non-firemen and somebody else that doesn't really know, we talk about this right here. This, the window that's coming down right here on this Chevy Blazer, that is going to be the A post. What they have cut and is laying down right here, that would be the B post. C, D keeps going on like a school bus could be going on and on. So we talk right here on this particular picture that is a frontal injury. That's a head on collision. It could be a head on with the pole. It could be head on with whatever that they may have taken place in. You talk about your lateral or T-bone, we know that kind of makes the T. So if a car comes and hits it here, that's going to be a T-bone. And you have to worry about any type of intrusion here. So if there's a lot of deformity into that vehicle, they may, some important information may be what, how far intrusion into the vehicle was. The good thing we have now is cell phones. I'm a big proponent of taking pictures of the scene because once you get to a facility, and you turn around and then you try to explain to the trauma doctor or explain to them what's going on, you can show them visual pictures. I know that some of the services also have their tough books, their computers that have frontal cameras that you can take picture from inside your ambulance, but we all carry cell phones. We have the technology at our fingers. So it's really good to take a picture of your scene. Obviously we don't want to take one with our patients in there, but uh, it gives them a really good idea once we get to the facility. All right, so three collisions in a typical impact. So let's see here. So the collision of a vehicle against another vehicle, a tree or some other object, and the collision of the passenger against the interior of the vehicle. So no matter what, even in all of these pictures right here, we know that our patients have potential to make contact with the vehicle itself because you're going to have knee injuries in here. You'll have uh, chest injuries around to the steering wheel. It appears, now I know what appears looks like, but it, it does look like they actually cut this seat to lay it back. They may have cut right in here into where the seat hinges to cut that to either get the patient out. So in here, and you're looking at this head-on collision here where they hit the light pole. A lot of your vehicles nowadays are actually, when they're made, when they hit, you have your motor and your transmission stick together. When they make impact, they're made to drop instead of just stay hard part and push on through the vehicle. It, it can happen to where you can have some intrusion into the vehicle with the uh, transmission and motor, but a lot of your newer vehicles are made to just, their motor mounts are made to break and they drop down to the ground. You can see in those pictures right there, I, I know one's a Chevy Blazer. I'm not real sure what that top picture is. Those are some of your older vehicles. They do hold up real well for the firemen have to cut out those B posts and all that to make uh, more access to the patient. This is very helpful. You can't, I can't tell you how to always remove a patient from a traumatic injury, from a vehicle or from a rollover, because they're all different. I don't care if I work nothing but motor vehicle accidents. I guarantee you that all of them are going to have potential injuries in different forms. So we're going to see those. So trying to tell you, hey, make sure you lay this down. It's just not going to work. So the ability of seeing these and learning and what worked this time, can we do that next time? That is a benefit. I, I'm a huge proponent of extrication classes, things that let you learn how to cut vehicles, where to cut. So now we have to worry about your Teslas, your battery operated cars. We're, we can't cut here because they have these big power cores that run through some of your posts. We have to be cautious of. They have some companies out that has made scales of vehicles. You can layer them down. If you remove the outside, it shows you different uh, CAD images of these pictures. It's a really good source. We don't always have those in EMS. Some of the fire-based will have those services. Those potentially can have those, but that's just another tool in the toolbox. 
So the more that you're able to go to some classes on like extrication or hands-on training for removal of patients, it's, it's wonderful to have in your toolbox. All right, the collision of a passenger's internal organs do make contact against the solid structures of the body. So we talk about a coup contra coup. You all heard me say that a while ago. As the brain strikes the front of the skull, the body begins to move backwards. So then the head falls back against the headrest and or the seat, and the brain slams into the rear of the skull. Damage, in, damage is then produced to the, both the front and the rear. So if I'm driving along and I hit, I'm going to hit forward. As I come back, I'm going to make contact against the seat, and I'll have injuries there. You potentially can do that multiple times, depends on what type of accident it is. But as you can see in the picture on the right, because the guy on the left is look like he's gasping for air too, what we see is we see injury to the back of the skull. You can see that there is had been some bleeding there. I'm sorry, that is the bottom part of the skull. But the bottom left of that skull, you can see where there's some injury that have occurred back down here. On this picture, we see that he has contact in the front and he already has some bruising and bleeding in the back. So he has suffered from the coup contra coup effect because he made that frontal and rear impact. So our initial general impression of the patient and the evaluation of their MOI can help just basically figuring out some life-saving care. What, what are we going to do for them? Is this, do we have a frontal lobe injury or a, a rear injury? So we need to understand what particular parts of the lobes control what different parts of the body. So severe Several def severe deformity of the vehicle or intrusion into that vehicle does help correlate with some significant MOIs. So severe defor I cannot pronounce that tonight. I am sorry. Severe deformities of the frontal part of the vehicle. You have some moderate intrusions from the lateral T-bone uh, collision, and you have severe damage from the rear. All of those can create different types of injuries but they can also mimic each other. They can have some of the same, just depends on which way the body made contact. Now, digital photos of the crash scenes uh, may provide valuable information, like we said when we get to the facility. Obviously, so I do wanna say this. So make sure if you happen to take pictures of a scene or potential injury, we need to make sure that we can use that in education, but if it shows any type of the patient, obviously we can't, we have to be cautious of that, but you should never ever show these on social media. I know a lot of people are, I'll pick on my son, he's a huge Snapchat, so he sends everything, you don't even realize he's snapping something, but if we take a picture, we post it on Facebook, we can be held liable for some information. We talk about, that's that could be, you, a good friend of yours is aunt, and now they have proof of it because they can screenshot it even before you take it down, and now you're held responsible for releasing some of that information out there, and that can hurt you in the long run. So be very cautious. Uh, I would only take pictures of the incidents to show the facilities and then delete those pictures. Even if they say, hey, I know you work this rate. Can you tell me? Hey, man, listen, I, I really can't. I don't have any information. I, I don't even have the pictures anymore. So be cautious about that. Some frontal crashes. He at least was wearing his seatbelt, so that's a good thing. So some understand. So understanding the MOIs after a frontal crash does help in our evaluation. And we talk about the supplemental restraints. They talked about a seatbelt, as in that picture. We all know about the airbags. And then you will see these wrecks to where the airbag didn't deploy, but it destroyed the front end of the car. Can't tell you why. It may have had impact on a particular corner that did not set the sensors off for that airbag to deploy. But at the same time as you can have your simple pulling in the garage and accidentally bump the, the front part of your garage and it sets your airbag off. I don't know. Those are weird and different types of things. So we need to determine whether the passenger was restrained. Back in the old days, we used to have the uh, seat belts that would come across you. They would come from the front back and they were like, they're still three point contacts, but, and you talk about lap belts and all that. So trying to figure out what type of seat belt that they were wearing, we can look at that particular, particular injury and tell that this person took a pretty severe injury from their seat belt. But it appears that they're still able to tell what's going on. Now, this guy does look like they're in some good injuries, two IVs. 
and you know does have a a main line so there's a lot of things in this picture that you see that it is pretty traumatic but at the same time is he still around and able to tell what's going on you know what happened and all that when we talk about seat belts we know that these seat belts can cause some unseen abdominal injuries think about any time that you have an abdominal injury that you always want to make sure you at least put a four lead on your patients as advances to get an idea of what's going on. Because if they have abdominal pain, do the seatbelt run straight across here? We know that's where our heart sits. So we could potentially, sorry, kick the table. We could potentially have some cardiac uh, damage due to our potential wrecks. We want to look for those abrasions or those traction type injuries to their face or the lower part of their neck and body, as you can see in that particular picture. And then maybe a supplemental uh, restraint system can also cause harm wherever they are used to properly they are used properly or improperly. Be cautious about the ones that wear the seat belt that they put it over their shoulder and put it in the back because now they just have a, a lap belt. You can still have some of those injuries, but you don't have the three point protection. You just have more of it retracting into your abdomen. So you can potentially bust like your spleen or have some other issues for just wearing that, that lap belt alone. So here we can see the different points of contact as we've had. Thank you, Bethany. I appreciate that. You can have those points of contact from different types of injuries. So the knees can strike the dashboard, as you see in that front left picture. So what they're doing is you're going to potentially have knee pain along with hip pain. And just on that very first picture, they can also have hip fractures. So you want to make sure that you look for those. If you see any kind of shortened and rotated that will that's one of those little telltale signs that they have some hip a hip injury or a fracture serious chest injuries and abdominal injuries can result from striking the steering wheel as you see in the second picture and also automatically assume that you're going to have some spinal injury we talk about the neck because in all those pictures they have had they have some neck the way that you see those is you can tell that they're in a position to where their heads have been kicked and turned to where now they're going to have potential neck injuries. So it is our job to either put them in a KED to remove them from the vehicle with a C-spine, or we can move them straight over to a backboard. It, it's But we need to just assume that there's back injuries. Now, I know a lot of services were like, if the patient doesn't complain of it and they're up walking around, we don't have to always put them on a spinal board or even the spinal board can cause more injuries than what we than us not putting them on there. So being cautious about putting the ones on there that don't need it, or we can get them to, you can clear the C-spine injuries and not have to put it on at all. So we know when an injection, we talk about eject, being ejected from the vehicle, we know that is a second impact injury. So the reason why is they're being ejected from the vehicle and then they their body comes in contact with the ground or other potential objects that are outside the vehicle. So it is like a an explosion and where they get it spilled. So you have your first one of the vehicle accident, that's your primary explosion. You have your secondaries where they uh, make contact inside the vehicle and they were pushed out. That is a good question. So I'm showing my age there. Are KEDs even carried on the trucks these days? I know in my particular service, yes, the, in this area, we still have KEDs here. We have them even on the platform. KEDs are phenomenal, but I will tell you, I actually have used more KEDs on, on pediatric patients than anything else. I am not knocking the pediatric boards. I'm not knocking any pediatric thing that we have, but KEDs are phenomenal when taking care of children. You can put them in there. You can basically burrito them, and they can't go nowhere. They're stuck there. So yes, you got to hear them scream and cry and all that, but it is a very good thing. Let me catch up on some of y'all's messages real quick. I'm not sure if Patricia or Bethany is in there working on that. I don't know where my chats went. Oh, doesn't matter. We'll figure it out at the end. Okay, Great, so Bethany, we're all, I'm working on getting it as I can. Thank you. I'm sorry. They. They come through my phone and then they hit the computer and I see your names, all that. So I'm going to let y'all handle that. Thank y'all. So on your ejections, we know just automatically assume that you're going to have a multi-system trauma and it's going to be bad. Most of the ones that you see are bad. I have worked a few of my 
rear to where they were thrown from the vehicle and landed in a muddy embankment or the water absorbed them and they were able to get out. They didn't have that much injuries from being thrown from the vehicle, but they had a lot of injuries from the particular uh, wreck itself. Assuming, I know what assuming does, but we want to assume th that they are going to have a multi-system trauma because of the mechanism of injuries. So a dangerous lung injury may occur if your patient takes a deep breath just before impact. We talk about hyperinflating the lungs or closest to the glottis. The impact of the steering wheel can injure the lungs by generating pressure in the lungs beyond the capacity of the lung tissues. So what they're saying is they're, they take a deep breath and they hold it because there's no that something's supposed to happen. At the same time as that, that can cause, a, they can rupture a lung. You can have a penetrating object to where now that they have a sucking chest injury or if they're complaining, I just, oh, it hurts to breathe. I can't take a deep breath. Start oscillating on your patient. Make sure you listen to them and don't just listen to the front of the lobes of the chest. Make sure you uh, oscillate all four areas, the chest underneath the uh, left and right breast and then in the top and bottom of the back. Do your best to hear as much of those lungs as you can to where you're like, I, I don't know if I heard anything on the left side. I, hey, can you check real quick? It's okay to have somebody that's part of the, your crew to check that. Maybe you didn't hear it. Maybe the scene was loud. You had trouble hearing those. So that is one. That's why they say when you know that you're getting ready to be into an impact or something happens, you're just supposed to go limp. Yeah, okay. That's what's going to happen. We all tense up because we know we're like, oh, this is going to hurt. We do that now. So if let's say you go to the doctor and get a shot. If you don't like them, you're going to be like, oh, that wasn't that bad. But if you just go and take it and move on, th that's better. That's what they say. I can just tell you what they say. All right. So rear end crashes. We've all worked these. We understand what potentially can come out of them. Rear end crashes. We can have that whiplash injury. That coup contra coup can definitely take place there. The patient may sustain an acceleration injury to the brain just because of that coup contra two effect where they go forwards and backwards. And then they sit there. It's like taking a ping pong ball on a cup and just rub it, just taking and shaking it up. It's going to hit everywhere. Let's see. Passengers in the back seat wearing only lap belts may have a higher incidence of injuries to the thoracic and lumbar. If you pull up to a wreck and it's just a two car MVC, but there's five people standing around, you're like, who's involved and who's not? Okay. I need the ones involved to stay here, the ones who are not. If you just do me a favor, step to the side for just a second. They're like, I'm holding this arterial bleed. I want you to stay right there and hold that because that's a life threat. So trying to differentiate who's there, who's not, who's hurting, what's hurting, that's a big part. Your lateral crashes, like the picture on the bottom, we're still going to look at seeing some whiplash there. Uh, patients could experience some rotation of their neck, some lateral flexion, and a combination of both. They're good. I would rather be hit from behind than the side because that's just a personal thing. I just think it's going to hurt a whole lot worse. You getting smoked like that on the on the side. It looks like that picture took some good damage. It broke the A post, as y'all can see right there where the window comes up. It was looked like it was pretty rough. So seeing that, we want to make sure that we would look into that and check on them and all that. If there's substantial intrusion into the passenger com compartment, suspect a lateral chest and abdomen injuries on the ins on the side of the impact. So we know if we're sitting here, we're driving and we take it this way, or let's say if I'm the driver and I'm going to take it from the driver's side, we potentially can have rib fractured ribs, a femur, a radial ul a illness, all those injuries because I'm here and I'm going to tense up. So my arm could be, your leg could be broke, you have that pelvic injury. All those could take place. And so we need to automatically assume that in this extremities during our initial assessment, we want to check all that. We're going to put our hands on. We're going to check them. We're going to make sure the extremities are there. If there's pain, let's note it. We can come back to that. Obviously, if there's some bleeding, shortness of breath, something like that, let's fix that to begin with. If it's just oozing, we'll be all right. We'll check it back in just a minute. Those are some of those that we want to make sure to dive into. We want to look into those later on. If it's an obvious break, let's splint that to where it's at. Check for those pulses. There's multiple things that we need to check for when we're going through and finding these, these injuries. Anytime that you have any types of these 
crashes to where you have your blunt trauma, penetrating trauma, and all that. Let's see here. We'll probably take a break in just a minute. We don't have, this is not, not a huge lecture, but I want to make sure I still give y'all a minute or two to take a break. Tell you what, we'll finish. So this is not an eight of 13. Let's do these 13 slides. We'll take a break after that. So rollover crashes. We cannot tell you what type of injury we're going to have. We just don't know. There's all potential. There's a huge potential for multi injuries. We just literally take it as face value and we work with what we got. An unrestrained passenger may have sustained multiple strikes with the interior of the vehicle. Uh, you may have that partial ejection like this particular picture is here. The most common life-threatening event in a rollover is the ejection or a partial ejection of the particular passenger or patient we're going to have. Even when restrained, passengers can sustain severe injuries during a rollover crash. Very true. I know I, we can go down that battle of who I've had more crashes, people have die or had worse injuries from wearing their seatbelts than not. And then you can have, I've had more injuries from not wearing their seatbelt versus that they should have. We, we can't make that. And we know certain states have these laws. That is the law that you must wear it. I'm still one of those that's a personal decision. Plus, I don't like hearing that ding and going off in my truck. I don't like how they had to do it. But again, we can't say you have less injuries with seat belts or more injuries without seat. We, it's hard to make that decision. I encourage, hey, if the law is the law, I'm going to read it. Hey, the law says you're supposed to wear your seat belt. But knowing those potential injuries of what we're going to see, we want to expect the worst. It's easier to be like, oh, okay, that's easy. I can take mark that off the box. I can mark that off, and we can work our way down. But it's harder if we're sitting like this with our blinders on, and we're not paying attention to the outside. So expect the worst, and it's easier to work our way in versus sitting here and you're like, oh god, now you got to work out, and you're behind the eight ball trying to catch up to those. Rotational crashes um, are injuries in a result of a combination of frontal and lateral impacts. We have three-point seat belts are effective in preventing any type of injury and angle crashes up to a 45 degrees. Pretty sure that probably come from a CDC uh, or the American Crash something database. I forgot what it stands for. So that's hard to I'm trying to think about what I can talk about that one, but I'm going to leave it as face value. We'll go to the next one. So vehicle versus pedestrians. So think about height. Height is our biggest thing. If the person is taller, they're an adult, they're going to more likely go up and over. Your younger ones or your shorter ones are going to go down and under. So if you stand next to your vehicle and you're like, oh, man, that's a lot of injuries that I'm going to take place. You're correct. It is. It's going to be a very bad incident. But looking at the okay, I'm going to have hips, I'm going to have legs, I'll have extremities, I potentially can have a head injury. Again, I want to work from here down, not from here out. So preparing myself when I go to any wreck, I'm expecting to see blood, guts, and glory from every single one. I don't care if it's a wreck in your driveway. That's what I expect, and I want to work my way down. Injury to pattern, I talked about that, depends on the height. We know that we can have, let's see, pedestrian rotates onto the hood or pedestrian rolls off onto the ground. We know in some places, those are the big things. You get hit by cars. That's one. Um, they don't get hurt, but they get they do hit you and all that. So those are some of the things we want to look into is preparing what potential injuries that we do come across um, depends upon their height. So any type of pedestrian injuries, let's prepare for that. But we want to make sure that we do a good initial assessment and then turn around and work our way down. A vehicle versus bicycle. We see this a lot in more of your children because they just, the good thing is kids have no fear. One is because they have not faced anything and they're not walking be like, oh, I've got to be careful. This may have this. I love that the leap of faith children have because they don't have those bad incidences. They don't have those bad thoughts, but we have to be prepared for those. We want to make sure we evaluate their MOI. In any type of situation we go to, if there's a children involved, let's take the whole trauma protocols and put on this particular patient. The children do, they don't compensate well, so we have to think we can identify this injury first. Now, granted, if it's interior of the body, things like that, we're not going to be able to see them. We'll have those problems and work about and have those issues when we get to them. Uh, presume that the patient has sustained an injury to the spinal column. 
or spinal cord until proven otherwise at the hospital. That's where I was talking about applying their C-collar, putting them on a spinal board, just so we know what we're going into. Having those ideas and looking at that, we want to make sure that we prevent that because if we get to the hospital and be like, he told me he didn't hurt there. That's something we want to be cautious of. The Working on that, we if we take care and, and take care of that first, it we we're, we own it. We know that we will work on that versus getting there and you're like, my bad, doc, sorry, sorry about that. That's going to hurt you more in the long run because you'll have those incidences where those you get to a, and a standard where you don't evaluate that. And then when you bring somebody in, you're like, oh, it's not that bad. And the, the, the facility starts to trust because they don't know you initially. And now you've worsened that. Being cautious and looking out for your MOIs on the front end is a good thing, knowing, hey, I, I may have the worst. This is what I'm looking for. So we talk about motorcycle crashes, especially dangerous because of the riders. They don't have anything to protect them besides what they may be wearing. If they are wearing a helmet, uh, a lot of your place, people wear uh, leather. Those do help, but they don't have that airbag or, or that seat belt to maintain them. We've seen the worst ones where you go there and they may be dismembered. We don't ever get to go to those where they just you know roll up on top of the car and you sit there and they're looking. That Those are luck. Patients who have experienced a motorcycle crash should undergo a cervical spine assessment. We want to make sure that we put them in a C-spine situation until proven otherwise. We talked about leather clothing, how good it helps. Look for deformity in the motorcycle on the side of the, the side most damaged. The distance of a skid on the road, if there's any type of groove patterns in their helmets. Um, I don't like to remove helmets unless it's a airway problem. I want to leave those there and let the facility move those. It's easier to leave them in place and secure them because you can't get a C collar on with the helmet. But if we leave that, that helmet in place, we can use that as a cervical spine. We can hold them in line and basically we can put tape down on their helmet to hold it to the backboard. It ain't going nowhere. It's a little bit more stable than trying to risk taking that off to create any type of other spinal injuries while we're trying to assess them. Let's see, there's four types of motors, vehicle wrecks that they call it. They have a head-on crash, angular crash. The angular is where the rider sustains direct crash injuries to the lower extremities between the object and the motorcycle. Sometimes that does trap their legs and will cause fractures or dislocations. Uh, traumatic amputations are also very highly expected in those high-speed injuries. Obviously, we talked about the, we know we're potentially going to have ejection. And then you may have those controlled crashes, where I mean is where the rider theirself lays the bike down, or if something causes them to lay that bike down. Now, that is a particular technique. Uh, a lot of your police officers that do ride motorcycles on, on duty do go through certain classes that train them how to lay their bikes down and stuff like that. <laughs> But it's not really something you can just go out and learn because I'm not laying my $30,000 bike down just to try. I don't want to do that. Let's see here. So the lay down or the control crash is a technique used to separate the rider from uh, the body of the motorcycle and the object to its hit. So they try to push away from that vehicle, uh, from the motorcycle itself, to separate themselves. If injuries from off-road vehicles, we may have... Hold on. I didn't read that right. A rider unable to clear the bike will continue into the vehicle, often will devastate in injuries. If injuries from off-road vehicles, reaching the patient is often a challenge. So if you're on a motorbike and they're on a trail ride and something happens and they get, we may have to transport that patient or and us to get to there. So we may have to use ATVs or UTVs to get to them. Now, trying to put them on there, stabilize them and get them back is going to be the most challenging. It depends upon the area because you're like, all right, we're going to strap them to the back of this ATV. Well, we can, yes. How are we going to secure them, keep them from falling off? Don't want to cause any more harm. And then we, all the holes we went through to get here, we now have to go back through those to get out. So that's going to take some challenges there. They do have special made vehicles in some areas. I know like your national parks have some vehicles that are made for that and they put the patients in there. I've seen and they have shops that don't let the patient move that they'll ride up and down. That's a lot of money. But 
knowing your resources in your area could actually help you out in some of those events. We talk about slip tricks and falls. Falls is a big one. We know that anything one times your height can cause greater injury and or potential death. Internal injuries are at least the least obvious in this situation. We won't see those. We know that they may have that compression injury to the spine or the legs. We Sometimes we can see that where their leg will have that blowout where the bone actually protrudes. But we those are rare. We may not see that. Uh, patients who fall and land on their feet may have less severe uh, internal injuries because their legs have absorbed much of that energy from, energy from the fall. Any type of fall from greater heights, we want to make sure that we consider how high they came from, what type of surface that they struck, and what body part actually hit first. So if they landed on their feet and they tucked and rolled, they've probably done this before, but if they landed on their feet and was lopped, you're going to have more injuries than that. The body's not able to absorb it because you didn't crouch and fall and all that. We used to be able to do that a whole lot easier the younger we were. We would jump and roll and all that. Now it's because I got trouble getting out of the bed. So thinking about those falls, we want to make sure that we do that full assessment, look for those things and be like, okay, what, what am I missing? Oh, how high did they come from? And you're like, you came from up there? That's where you came from. Asking those good questions or those open-ended questions will give you a lot of information. I show that it is 6.53. Let's take 10 quick minutes. And like Miss Patricia says, when my camera clicks back on, we'll be good to go. So at 7.03, I will see y'all right back. All right. Have you gotten Lauren? All right. Maybe I was the one that was a little behind. So sorry about that. Trying to catch up on everything. So I'm squared on the chat. But thank goodness. We have some wonderful folks behind the scene catching up on y'all. So I do appreciate that. All right. So I'm going to get back to this. They are doing phenomenal without me. So I'm going to let them keep it up. Minimize this. All right, so we talked about fall. Now let's go into penetrating trauma. I'm just going to say that looks like that hurts. That looks like that hurts real bad. Um, I bet he also has a little trouble breathing. I noticed the chest tube, so I'm going to say yeah. All right, so penetrating trauma can be classified as low energy, medium energy, or high energy. Uh, low energy. Low energy penetrating trauma may be caused accidental by impalement or intentional by a knife, ice pick, or any type of other weapons. So point blank and high velocity gunshot wounds result in a highly more sufficient energy. Angle or direction travel is also very pertinent. We, we want to know this one looks like it's a through and through, probably self-inflicted if I had to guess. If gunshot wounds, we want to know if they any type to the abdomen, they affect any type of internal organs, because they may not have a huge significance to the entrance and exit, but remember that they can bounce around. The caliber of the bullet does de depend on a lot. So if it's a smaller caliber, or even if it's unknown, we need to make sure that we look for a penetrating, sorry, an exit wound because we need to see if we can find it or if there's a potential for it still being impaled. A really good friend of mine, I'll tell you an instance, ran a call here in the Rankin County area. A uh, young female was shot. She did receive, I want to say it was, she said, she, he said she took it, I think it was like in the flank area. Initially, when they got there, she was walking and talking and breathing. They got her to sit down. They were unable to find a exit wound, but they noticed that her blood pressure started dropping. They assumed, hey, look, there's some abdominal injuries. We think she's bleeding internally, but they weren't able to find anything. On the way to the hospital, she, she coded on them. They worked and worked. They got her back. She coded again. By the time they got to the ER, they did get her back, but she ended up dying. Come to find out, when she took the shot in the flank area, the bullet actually penetrated uh, in between her buck cheeks. So it bounced around all on the inside of her internal organs. And yes, she did have some internal bleeding. But what we have to think about is they were worried about it. So they were on the right track. They had things going. 
but they weren't able to find an exit wound, so they thought the worst. It was sad, though. She was like 17, 18 years old, but they would have never found the exit wound. The only reason it was found is during an autopsy. They actually rolled her over, and they actually saw where it was. And they had already cut and removed her clothing, but even her clothing did not have any sign of the bullet exiting. So it most likely came out into the soft tissue area of her cheeks and probably fell out during all the movements and all that. So we try to, we assume the worst. We're guessing, hey, this is going to be a very bad one, even though it's through and through. What potential organ is in the area that may end up fighting us as we're trying to take care of this patient? We need to first determine the number of penetrating injuries, then combine that information with what we already know about the potential pathway. There's a pretty good slide coming up I really like. Gunshot wounds, we know that the path of the projectile is referred as uh, trajectory. Fraggable bullets will increase damage as multiple fragments increase the likelihood of multiple organs and vessels. Let's take for example, let's talk about a shotgun. If we want to talk about bird shot, if we're going turkey hunting, bird hunting, you don't shoot just a slug of a bullet. You shoot pellets. So those pellets can, they fra- they shoot out, they try to obviously kill what's in front of you if I'm turkey hunting. But then we let's talk about a regular handgun. So you have your full metal jacket that is a full solid piece. It's basically the same round that I'm going to go to the gun range with. So I can hit the paper target downrange, or I can actually hit a metal target. Those don't always fragment. Yes, there is potential that they will, and you can actually get some fragments back at you. But if you take a hollow point, even in deer hunting, talk about ballistic tips, anything like that, they spread. They mushroom when they hit, and the parts of those bullets separate. They go outward. So you're going to have more internal injuries. You're going to have those projectiles that embed in different parts of the body. My notes, I just went over that. That's exactly what I said. Thank you, notes. And give me just a second. Huh? Thought you were talking to me. Oh, all right. So we now here's the good picture. This is what I really like. So the bullet speed is a major factor in resulting injuries pattern. So... Different calibers fire at different feet per second, and it's going to shoot faster than a 45 because it's lighter. A 45 is heavier. It has more powder to push it, but it's going to fall off faster. So you can see on the far left where the bullet is entering uh, the body, the cavity, and all that. So as it goes through, it has the, the shock wave that is bringing it, that is expanding the area right in here. Now, the bullet is not going to, not for say, going to tumble in here unless it strikes something, but it's going to create this cavity right here. So not only is this cavity, let's say that's meat right there, that cavity is going to widen out, but you're now you're going to also have this widened path right here in the blue that's going to create on the inside of the soft tissues, the vessels, the inner lining of your skin. So this is All of this area is temporary. This is going to come back. It's going to have swelling. It's going to have fluid to the area. But this hole right here, coming all the way through here, that's going to be, they call it a permanent cavity. It's the same thing like if you were to go deer hunting and you shoot a deer, that wound is always going to be there. You've all seen these pictures of deer that has been hit by such and such that that didn't kill them. You have those everlasting injuries they're not going to go back now they may be able to in surgery close this up and close this end up and they may do some back in here but this that's always going to be there when a bullet comes through it does carry heat with it not like microwave heat but it's still going to have that generated heat that's going to come through with it so it's going to it's going to cauterize it now you're going to have heavy bleeding because it's going to come from all this area in here but This will be there. If you have a, say, a bullet wound, you're going to always have that on the inside. You'll have that good little nasty scar that always sticks to you on the outside. Knowing that, and that tells you what type of kind of injury that you're going to see. And the size of the hole depends on the size of the bullet, the size of the the actual, if it's a full metal jacket, hollow point, anything like that. It's going to determine that on how much mushroom has created on the inside of the body. 
as you see here, he is no longer shooting right-handed. He is probably a left-handed shooter. But this right here shows you that the relationship and the severity depends on the type of weapon that was involved. I'm not saying that doesn't hurt, but that's ow. Yeah, that hurts bad. It appears that it was from a distance that he got shot, but majority of that is on the, let's say, palm of his top hand. You can see some burn marks in here. I don't think that's burn marks. You'll see some burn marks here. I don't want to say that was a close reference shot but that's a large pow that's a large caliber bullet that has caused that because right in here this is some tendons tendons to his fingers that's was the bone to his thumb i'm sure there was bones in here to his fingers i'm pretty much sure probably his pinky's fine he can probably move that but he will he may end up losing these uh, unless you have a good surgeon but the caliber does determine a lot so we'll talk about blast injuries. Although most commonly associated with the military conflicts, we have seen these in our civilians and our homeland. We talk about there's been multiple explosions that try to even account of. So more common today is owning the increased use of explosives as tools and our urban terrorist activities inside the United States from meth, from meth labs to uh, other types of explosions. Not only are meth labs dangerous, but they... I've always said this, even when I was in the police field, those people are dumb, but they're not stupid. They, I feel like they are a, a crayon short, but they're pretty smart when they start mixing these chemicals for these meth labs. So you don't see those as much. More of your shake and bakes, your rolling labs, and that's where you have, a more, to me, is a more concern than a fixed location. Even though on your blast injuries, we talk about this again, we talk about our primary blast injuries. We know this is entirely due to itself, the blast itself. We know that's there. We know that primary blast has a lot of damage. We know that damage that is caused to the body it is because of the pressure that is generated by the explosion. We talk about flash burns. Flash burns are also considered part of the primary injuries. So you talk, there's a better picture. So organs are affected, generally affected by the primary blast effects are the lungs, eardrums, and other uh, compressible structures. A lot of the militaries that have come back from Afghanistan and Iraq, they have a lot of lost hearing because of the particular injuries that they have gone through. The blast will damage, rupture, or even terminate any part of their inside of the ear. So they come back as being deaf. Sometimes that is fixable, but those initial pressure waves do knock those out. That's where they say that they had their, their breath taken away from them. The air was knocked out of their lungs because of that initial blast wave. So proximity to the origin of the pressure wave is associated with a high risk of injury or death. Depends on how big the bomb was, depends on how, what when they left their feet and they landed on, depends on what they were wearing. Let's say, as in like the Boston bombing, people weren't wearing flak vests and everything like our military does. So we did have more injuries and the loss of uh, limbs and stuff because of what they were wearing. Yes, we lost a lot of good servicemen due to the IEDs and explosions that we've also come across in the Middle East. But you... You look at that versus the civilian side, you, you do have more casualties and more injuries because of there is no protection out there. A lot of people just don't walk up and down the street wearing those heavy class three flat vests. That's not something common that we do as an individual. So you see this picture right here. So you see the primary blast. That is what has expelled anything from the surrounding area or from the blast itself. This person has lost their balance. They have been knocked off their feet. You probably will have that initial hearing injury, the lungs. That's if you go to a um, mass casualty incident here, you're gonna have a lot of your walking wounded that just can't hear. That's why we need to use hand motions. Hey, if you can hear this and you can move, get up and move towards me. Waving your hand towards you gives them a better idea of what to do because they're not going to be able to hear you. Now, your secondary blast injuries, that's injuries due to missiles being propelled by the blast force, as we talked about here. 
So this, like I said, can be from the surrounding or from the blast itself. You have your tertiary, which is your third injuries that are due to impact of other objects. If I was thrown against a brick wall, that, that's one of them. And then your last type of blast injuries, uh, you have burns, some type of crushing injuries and toxic inhalations. So that can be from the heat that has burned them, any type of other chemical that's put in there. I have heard where they put ammonia and chlorine in there until once it gets in the wound, you have that, you type out like your dirty bombs, things like that, inhalations and all that causes those worst effects. So again, these people are not stupid that make these. They're pretty smart. They, they know what they're doing. They make them out of a pressure cooker that is just, it's loaded with whatever they put in there that may be set on a timer. These guys set in their garage that now they put them out in public. I'm very cautious of bags laying around or a box that just looks weird. I'm not going to walk up and kick it. I'm very cautious about that because I hate to say that you just can't trust people these days, but you really can't. You don't know what's there. Or if you respond to a call and the call is the, is the diversion for them to get your first responders and then it's set off. Be cautious of surroundings. Look at what's going on. Make sure that you do that good look around. What do what are people doing? Is there uh, do you see wires or anything like that hanging out? Because that's the same thing we had in the old Tommy Atlanta bombing one from the Olympics back in the in Atlanta. They had multiple ones that were set to go off to get those first responders to injure those people to cause more havoc than what they initially started. We talked about that. We talked about that. Talked about that. All right. Tissues. Organs that contain air are the most susceptible to any type of barotrauma. That is a pressure change. The change in the pressure around creates that barotrauma. The tympanic membrane is a very sensitive indicator that you can use to help determine the possible presence of other blast injuries. If the patient may report ringing in the ears, pain in the ears, or some loss of hearing, and blood may be visible in the ear canal. At the same time as if we notice that clear solution coming out of the ear, we do want to check that to see if it's any type of any type of brain fluid or if it has any type of starring pattern. Once we've checked it, that's what we're looking for. We know that now they do have a TBI or that traumatic brain injury. So the pulmonary blast injuries, pulmonary trauma that results from a short range explosion to the detonation of the explosion is going to be your lungs. Um, we know they're air filled. Like it said in the other, a few minutes ago, that's going to be the primary is anything that's filled with air is going to suffer the most. The patient may report some tightness or pain in the chest and may cough up some blood. Any type of pneumothorax is very common in an injury and may require emergency decompression in the field by a paramedic. Decompressions are, are, are very, they're, they're, they're nerve wracking. I've done two in my life. One, the first time I could, it was a clinical setting. I was able to do it and heard the rush of air as hell. The second one, I was not. I was having trouble hearing. And I remembered a skill that I was taught years and years ago on how to find out. That's my little, so now anytime that I do it, I, so the way that I do is I take a 10C syringe, I squirt five mils out and I hook it up to my needle decompression. That way, if it does, I can see the bubbles that will come out of that. That is one of those that helps me. It's a visual acuity thing that I can see what's going on. Um, we talk about pulmonary edema, maybe also very rapidly insuring. Um, arterial and air embolisms occur in our alveolar, alveoli that are disruptions with the subsequent air embolism into the pulmonary vascular area. Some solid organs are relatively protected from the shock wave. Um, but may be injured by a secondary missile or some or their body being hurled from the explosion. Our hollow organs may be injured by similar mechanisms as the lung tissues. Some underwater explosions result in the most severe abdominal injuries. Think about this too. That's your the shock wave that's going to affect, and it's going to our bodies are made up of water. If we happen to be around or anything like that, we're going to have more of those internal injuries. Your neurologic injuries and head trauma are also the most common causes of death from any type of blast injury resulting because those are going to be blood in our skulls that we just can't see and they're going to fill up 
and start adding some compression inside on the brain and causing a lot of issues. We need to be careful, look for those, have ideas that those are there and that they're present. Let's see, multi-system trauma refers to injuries of a person who has been subjected to multiple trauma injuries involving more than one part of the body. Multi-system trauma patients do have a very high mortality than any other category that we go to. Let's see, recognizing patients who fit into this classification and provide treatment and transportation and alert the receiving facility that we're coming in has them prepared to uh, go down this road. They have the right people in place for when the injuries come in. Some golden principles of pre-hospital trauma care, make sure that our safety is always number one. Determine the need for additional personnel, equipment, you may need some other response resources that show up. You may need a hazmat team. I'm one of those, bring them all, bring everybody. Because the more people are there, the better off it is. And that's the way I've always believed. Let's see, beginning by assessing and maintaining the airway, including a ventilatory support and high flow oxygen while maintaining the cervical spine injuries. So if we Obviously, if we are the first ones on to a scene to a multi-casualty incident, we are going to run out of equipment. We are going to use everything that we have as we walk out and start to triage these patients. That's fine. That is okay. We can, we're not going to transport anyway. We are not going to be the first ones to show up on scene and start transporting. We're going to be the last ones to leave. So we can go back. We can restock. We can go out of service if that's what's needed but let's deplete everything we have to get these patients ready to be transported. So I've worked a couple of mass casualty incidents in my career. You, it, they're overwhelming. I don't know if this is in there, but anytime that you go to triage patients, you should not spend any longer than three to five seconds doing a type of triage on a patient because those now, if you're there six seconds, seven seconds, those one to two seconds that you spent staying there longer, you could have saved another life. So understanding that, we're not going to be able to save them all in a mass casualty incident, but we're going to do the best that we can with the resources we have to make our patients better. We're, we're going to be haunted by it. We're going to feel like we could have done more. We should have done more. That's automatically going to be there. So it... I. It's one of those, I can't prepare you for that, but that is one of those instances that we're just going to, we're going to deal with in our careers. We need to ensure that our uh, basic shock therapy is completed. If we start to recognize that they're having, they're going into shock, we need to just do that basic therapy on site and get ready for them to be transported. Obviously, we're going to address any type of ABCs that need to be fixed and rapidly proceed with spinal immobilization. It, but any type of blasting injuries, multi-trauma patients, I'm going to automatically see collar backboard them. I, they can clear them later and question me why I did it. You know what? You weren't there. I made that decision. For our critically injured patients, make sure you consider any type of paramedic intercept or air medicine or get them rolling when you, if you say, yeah, yes, I need them, go ahead and call them early. All right, so patient assessment, we need to make sure that we identify any life-threatening illness and injuries as soon as possible to help our patients in the long run. Uh, we need to basically apply the knowledge that we've learned as well as the appropriate assessment skills to assess any type of triage, treat, and transport our patients with those traumatic injuries to the most appropriate facility. So when we say the most appropriate, I don't want to take them to the closest Band-Aid station, if this patient needs trauma surgery, they need to go to a trauma center. And allowing your air medical, your critical care units to transport those patients is perfectly fine. You will be in charge until somebody, a higher level of training shows up to take over. So if you decide, hey, this patient is critical, they are definitely injured and we need them to receive higher levels of care. I'm fine with anybody. If they want to say, hey, I'll take them. Okay, you can take them. Because we know we always have those trauma junkies. Oh, that's all I want to do is work traumas. It's not going to be like that. There's going to be enough out there for us to take that place. So what we want to make sure is identify, fix what we can, 
move on, let somebody that a, has a higher skill and an asset of being able to transport, let them have them, let them roll on. Any type of injuries to the head from either a trauma, we know that these are unseen. We won't see those potential brain, those brain injuries all the time. We will see them if it's a traumatic event. Obviously, if we have an open fracture, we will. Sorry, talking to a kid. So we, we are not necessarily going to see any type of bleeding or swelling initially, but we know that breeding, huh, that bleeding or swelling is going to be a very life threat. So trying to identify that through either your initial set of vitals or signs that stand out to us will help us and prolong their care. So a neurological assessment should be coupled with the patient's level of consciousness will help us determine and provide some details on those changes in those, that patient's conditions. Any type of injury to the neck or throat uh, may result in some airway problems that could quickly become a very serious life threat. Our assessment must include some frequent physical examinations. We need to look for our DCAP BTLS. So our DCAP BTLS, let's go over that again. That is our deformities, contusions, abrasions, punctures or penetrations, burns, tenderness, laceration, and swelling in the neck area. I like to go ahead and do a DCAP BTLS all the way over, making notes as I go. Any type of swelling may prevent the flow of blood to the brain and cause an injury to our CNS system. Make sure that you always use an occlusive dressing on any type of neck wound, not a tourniquet. It's just, it's not the best thing to show up to the facility with the tourniquet around their neck. So either air in the circulation or and an airway cartilage fracture may cause some rapid death. So if there's air where it's not supposed to be, I like to say air goes in and out, blood goes round and round. Let's keep it that way. So if I have air going round and round, we know it's in the vascular system. Or if we have air going in and out and it's not through our nose and mouth, we got a problem. I need to fix it. At least with bleeding, we can put our hand over it. We can help control that. We can try to get them to occlude by themselves. If that's not working, we apply direct pressure. It's our last resort. But head, neck, or face, we can't use that tourniquet. So we're going to apply that bulky dressing. All right, injuries to the chest. So obviously, blunt trauma to the chest can cause a fracture to our rib or sternum, creating that respiratory issue. Depending on that particular severity of the trauma, the large vessels of the heart may be torn inside the chest, and we may have that unseen bleeding from the cardiac area. So a pneumothorax. So this is air that collects between the lungs, uh, the lung tissue, and the chest wall. This starts creating some compression in the lungs, and that interferes with the body's ability to effectively exchange oxygen. So if I have air between the rib cavity and my lung, I'm not able to get enough air expansion. So I'm like, I'm always going to have trouble breathing. Now a pneumothorax, oh, did I just say that? Yes, I did. So a tension pneumothorax now is, a, is lung tissue that becomes squeezed under some pressure until the heart is also squeezed. This does prevent uh, the venous blood from returning and thereby reduces the preload of our cardiac system. A hemothorax is blood that collects in the chest and causes interference with our breathing. So remember, pneumo is air and hemo is blood. Regardless of our particular injury, it is very imperative that we assess our trauma patient's region every five minutes. Remember, this is a trauma patient, so we're going to do it every five. If it's a medical or just a regular transport, we're going to do that every 10 to 15. Most of your monitors that should be on the street should be set automatically to every five minutes to check your vitals, not at a 10-minute period. It's easier for us to go in there and change that on our medical patients, but during our trauma patients, we're going to have so much going on that it's going to be hard for us to remember. Oh, I need to click the button. Oh, I got to click the vital signs again. So it's, a, it's, it's good for your services when they set them up to already have them set up to be every five minutes. And if we don't need it, we can go in there and change it. 
That's the best part about it, what it is. I like that we have that set at work here on the streets, all of ours that were all set to every five minutes. So injuries to our abdomens, we know that there's a lot of solid organs in there. So we may notice that they have a tear, laceration, or fracture. We're just not going to see them. So causes from those uh, lacerations or tears will create a lot, of, lot and lots of bleeding that will start to pool inside the abdomen. We will notice that the abdomen be becomes more firm, more rigid, and that's going to quickly lead to them uh, dying. So when our hollow organs are injured, they may rupture and start to leak some toxic chemicals that are used for digestion into our abdomen. That is for our facility to worry about. We can't do extraction of gastric fluids. This is not, it's not, mm -mm, it's not in our protocols and it'll never be. Healthy young adults are able to compensate a lot longer for others than on a blood loss areas. But we still need to maintain that high index of suspicion when we see that mechanism of injury. Now, if this MOI does suggest a huge potential chance for an injury of abdominal region injury, we need to be very alert to that. Make sure that you do your DCAT BTLS in that abdomen area. If they're complaining of that lower left quadrant hurting the most, let's not palpate that area first. We need to palpate that last. Because if we do that first, the entire abdomen region is going to hurt. So we just pooped ourselves and not, and we didn't do them any benefit. It is very hard, and a lot of your services do not allow you to give any type of narcotics, pain medicine, or whatever for any type of abdominal injuries. Because now, by the time they get to the facility, we have masked that pain. We have covered it up with, with medications. Now they got to wait hours or do an abdominal scan for any other types of bleeding. So be cautious of that. Make sure you understand your protocols on what you're allowed and what you're not able to do. And now reaching out to med control may be the best thing that you can do. Be like, hey, doc, this is what I got. I know that we can't give narcotics for or tortol or whatever for an abdominal injury, but there is no signs of traumatic injury there. I, I do feel that it is such and such. Or go off of your knowledge and the tool, tools that are in your toolbox to create that. Again, knowing your protocols, what you're able to do and what you're not able to do is going to benefit you when you start assessing these patients. Getting that knowledge. Ask those questions while you're on your trucks doing your, your ride-alongs. Why this? It's okay to ask why in the right time and place. My suggestion is never question a provider when they're dealing with the patient, always question them after the fact. You praise in public, you criticize in private, <laughs> unless it is detrimental to their life. One of those things. All right, so making your good decisions when we come to uh, transportation and destinations. We need to make sure that we have a very good working knowledge of resources that are in our area. When that we talk about that is in trauma centers, the different level of uh, facilities, who can take what and manage what here in Mississippi, that's where we rely on Mississippi MedCom. Now, majority of your services, we know what they can and can't take just because we go there so much, but if it's a such of a big resource that all of the state um, is at a surge level, we can't keep up with that. So reaching out to a trauma center, hey, can you take this? Hey, can you take that? You're not playing mother may I, you're just not trying to, it's, you're not trying to take up all of the resources for every single patient. Now, granted, here in Mississippi, they could probably take five, six really massive traumas back to back and still not limit their resources because they have a lot on board. But we have to make sure that we know those things. Let's see here, the, tra the trauma lethal triad. Let's talk about that. So trauma lethal tri triad of hypothermia and acidosis is a major contributor to death in patients with severe traumatic bleeding. Hypothermically, hypothermia contributes to the coagul coagulopath, uh, sorry, I messed that one up. 
So any factor that interferes with blood clotting will cause more blood loss. Aggressively seek med control on all bleeding that extends your base of knowledge. Reach out and grab that information if you need some other help. Do not hesitate in the use of a tourniquet to stop bleeding on an extremity as long as it is in, on an extremity and not in the head, neck, or face. Let's see, keep our patients as warm as possible. Make sure in this situation that our IV fluids are at least room temperature. We don't want to slam them with cold IV bags and a cold, let's say if it's 12 degrees outside, we don't want to shock their body with those cold fluids. We want to try to turn our defrosters on and put those IV bags up in the front of the windows just so it helps warm those up. Obviously, yes, we can make them scalding hot, but we don't want to do that. The best thing I've always done and kept in my mind is if I can pull my shirt sleeve up and it's warm to me on my skin, then I would insect that in somebody. But if it is scalding hot and it burns my arm, then I probably don't want to put that through their veins. Same time, obviously, any type of traumatic injury, we don't want to stay in play. We want to load and go. If we can, we need to make sure that we're there less than 10 minutes. That helps them in that golden hour. We know that at the same time, the golden hour is real big when it comes to stroke, but think about your scene time and how fast they really need to be at a higher level of care. We need to make sure we identify and really consider our scoring when it comes to how long can we be on scene? What was the type of MOI they had? Is there any type of decrease of level consciousness? Are they having those real issues with their ABCs? If they are, if I'm not able to control their, their circulation, let's say they're bleeding out, I need to go. I don't want to stick around. I, the faster I can give this patient to somebody, the happier Chris Wally is. It is not on me anymore. I can give that off, be like, look, they were breathing when they left my truck. Your scene time is a really big thing. Some of the things that kind of reduce our scene times or can add to it is when we talk about the use of air medical. If we know that this particular injury is going to take greater than 15 to 20 minutes to get them extricated, we may need that source because most of our facilities, unless they're in the air, is going to take anywhere between 30 minutes to spool up to get going because they got to check it. They got to check the weather. They got to make sure that everybody agrees to take that flight. So if you have your patient in your truck and you're like, oh, I really need the, I need, I really need air transport. Notifying them on the back end, it's easier to cancel them versus it is to get them in route. Because if I can get them in route and say, hey, I can meet you at such and such location, or I can meet you at this football field, is a lot better you're shorting your distance and time of getting that patient to a better facility. Now, some areas have certain restraints on use of air medical. Know what they are, know what they say, and if you have to have a paramedic make that decision, then get them in route early. I know here in Mississippi that you can call Mississippi MedCom, and as long as you can be just a regular civilian, as long as they file under a certain category and they ask you certain questions, and there's, I think it's three out of the five questions are marked, they automatically launch that aircraft and then they tell the service, hey, they get over to their channel or to the county channel and say, hey, just be advised, we did receive a call on this. We have launched one of our helicopters. We will be monitoring your channel. That way, it's helping you. I love when they do that for me, but I haven't been on a truck in quite a while, so that might be a difference. So I'm cool with the use of air medical, but I don't want to overuse one. So don't be like the crying wolf and say, mother, may I? And they now they got to ask because you've used them so much for every little thing. Make sure that they fit into that criteria. The AAMS, which is the Association of Air Medical Services, and a Medivac Foundation had identified some of the criterias for the appropriate use of air medical services on trauma patients. That is the same thing that they see. Now, 
the very very first bullet on yours that says distance to the trauma center is greater than 20 to 25 miles. That is not saying that they will not fly there, but that is part of what AAMS has said that you can be there faster than they can launch and land. That's one of their criteria. Now, they, your facility, your air medical group, whatever else, can override that and be like, yep, we're ready to go. We just, like our blades are still turning, even though we just landed, we'll be there. A lot of that takes place from officer involved shootings, first responder incidents, anything like that can be those guiding factors when it comes time to them overriding that 25 miles or less. The rest of that y'all can read right there. That's pretty easy. Destination selection. So we're going to talk about our hospitals, uh, specifically when it talks about trying to figure out uh, the different levels. So let's break this down. So all of our trauma centers are between a level one and a level four. The level one has the most resources. Again, I'm going to keep talking about Mississippi because that's what I'm talking about is a level one. We only have one level one in the state of Mississippi, and that is University of Mississippi Medical Center. There's several twos and threes, and there's a lot of fours. Fours are the, I don't want to say the worst because that's not the right facility, but a level four are typically found in those remote areas, and they don't really have the highest level of care because they have a lot of PAs and NPs working in the ER. Not saying that the trauma one level ones don't, they just, that may be what they're staffed with all the time. So in knowing what facilities are around in your area may help you determine those destination transports when it's time to. So when we get ready to start our transports, be like, man, this is like, I don't know, their GCS is like an eight, and I really need somebody. Don't take them to a four. They need to go to a two or higher. It is okay to stop at your level four because your patient is crashing, because again, they are a higher level of care than what we carry in the back of the ambulance. But let's say you're on a paramedic truck, and this paramedic says, no, I want to go here. That's their decision. They get to make that. Some areas do line exactly what can go to what facility, and then that, the doctors have to approve it. So it's going to be like, yes, I, I can take that patient, bring them here. But if you're calling them and saying, hey, I have a code, I have a trauma code coming in, that's your closest to facility that needs that higher level of care. Or if your paramedic's having trouble doing some intubation, or they can't get the eye gel or the, the, just the, a quick innovation tool in, that, that's going to be the place to go because they can help you and they can get the patient to a certain stable area and then you can transport them to another facility. That's fine, but knowing your facility levels and the capabilities is, is very important for what we have in our areas because that's going to help reduce our field deaths by knowing those, go into those most appropriate. That is it for our lecture tonight. Does anybody have any questions or concerns? I'm not going to say I'm going over the chapter or the chat because I think our two ladies have done a phenomenal job. Does anybody have anything else? Lindsay, quit lying. You didn't lose no internet. You'd be all right. You trying to leave early. All right, folks, I'm going to take that as no questions. Good luck on your test. Y'all have a great evening, and we shall see y'all on Wednesday. Other than that, y'all be careful and uh, be safe. Lindsay, be safe on your flight. Y'all have a good night.